Return of the King. We're back. So we're back. 101. Yeah. 101. Yeah. And we are joined today by Ben Ryan, who is our... Did I say your name right? It's Ryan, right? Yeah, you did. Ryan, yeah. Ben Ryan. Awesome. Still got it. <laughs> uh, who is our brain guy, but he's more than just a brain guy. So go ahead and let us know who you are, what you do. All right. So I'm a um, neuroscience PhD student. I'm in my fifth year, so I'm looking at graduation quite soon. Um, I'm studying at SUNY Buffalo. Uh, I'm in the Jacobs School of Medicine here, if you can see this. Um, and I study autism. So we basically study um, genetic mutations, essentially, that drive autism and try and understand what happens between the gene mutation and, you know, the autism, basically, you know, what's happening to the brain. So that's our, pretty much our MO. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's just jump right into it. So yeah. uh, let's get an in-depth dive into what is autism. What is autism? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like okay. how do you, how would you as we know what autism is obviously, but like as a neuroscientist, right? Mm-hmm. How would you describe autism? Okay. Well, let me start with, you know, like actually what is autism just in case mm-hmm. anyone yeah. doesn't. No, exactly. Sure. So, um, so it's a developmental disorder. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder, at least it's classified as that, in that it, it's brought on by some developmental changes in the brain. And the diagnostic criteria for autism are uh, social communication deficits, some sort of you know, difficulty communicating. Um, and then the second, which you have to have both, is repetitive behaviors, which is very interesting because you probably think of those two things as very separate. Um, but we often see them together. So anyways, yeah, I mean, from a neuroscience standpoint, you know, I, I guess I could talk about this for hours and hours. I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. From a neuroscience standpoint, the way I look at it uh, is that for every behavior, every function, everything you do there, you know, everything that happens in any organism that has a brain is driven by the brain and some sort of brain activity. Sociability is another one of those functions. And there are, you know, very concrete, um, you know, brain areas and specific molecular functions that are associated with sociability and any change or disruption in those, those brain areas or their function, um, or those cellular mechanisms can disrupt sociability. So that's kind of how I like to view it. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. So I'm sorry, Ali, you were about to say something, I think. I was just, yeah, well, I was just like, uh, so amazed how you were like, yeah, it's a near developmental, like disorder I right because a lot of people think that it's simple, yeah. a lot of people think it's a vaccine right mm. is it a vaccine <laughs> that causes it P- okay so funny story mm-hmm. okay quick answer no it's not <laughs> okay but, <Thank> you. <laughs> we got on the record <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh-huh. funny story mm-hmm. um my ex-girlfriend uh it's great to tell the story because she's my ex-girlfriend now <laughs> um shout out to your ex-girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> I was at a dinner with her and her family and her and her one like aunt or something like that was a lawyer and she was saying to me oh you know I, she, I mentioned I study autism and she said oh I'm in a I'm in a court case against a vaccine company because I'm working with this client who their child was perfectly normal and then they got an injection for a vaccine and then next week they had autism um you know how do you explain that you know I'm gonna we're gonna, suing them basically and I tried to explain to her that if autism was as simple as some ingredient being injected you know if if all it took was that one ingredient to cause autism then we would have a completely clear understanding of autism but we don't it's a it's a spectrum first off i mean you know there's obviously a range of causes and a range of you know sort of expressions of autism Mm. and it's just not that simple that we can just inject something into someone's arm and just affect their brain in a week you know you know you know what else is actually kind of annoying is that i see a lot of people when we discuss like pathological mental health when it comes down to the brain itself right they they seem to think like they forget that most of these diseases are a spectrum so it can range from anything within the spectrum and even in rare cases outside the spectrum and like they always think okay he's autistic so he's this this and that well it's like a yes and no kind of situation. I don't know if you've seen this in your work field where people forget that it's a spectrum, but like here I see it a lot. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, I 100% agree with you. I think that any biological condition is a spectrum. You know, I think mm-hmm. even cancer, you know, look at it. There are grades of cancer, you know, and severities. And I think that everything, like nothing, I've learned this from working with biological systems. And by that, I mean, literally, like taking brains, 
breaking them down, looking at what's happening in the cellular level. And even within, let's say, a breed of mice that are completely genetically identical, there's nothing there. They have no differences in their genes. They've had the exact same life. You know, they've all been raised in the same environment with the same people, you know, the same other mice. Um, and you look at like a specific molecules expression in the same area of the brain, and there's a variety of expression, which you'd think it would be exactly identical if our brains are guided by experience and genetics, but it's not. And so in the same sense, if you have a disruptive condition like autism or some, or, you know, cancer, whatever, there's going to be a difference, but then there's going to be variety within that difference. So you're going to end up having a spectrum in any condition. That's the way I see it. So, yeah, but I don't work with any uh, actual human patients. My stuff is all in mice, which is interesting. All mice. It's actually a really cool thing you just said there. You said that it's like a, they're all genetically similar and everything, except what you're saying is they don't experience these uh, emotions equivalently, let's say. So, do you think that this can all come back to like the pseudoscience of like spirituality and all that stuff, you know, where it's like each mice or each mouse might have its own spirit that it's like experiencing this thing differently, or I don't know, where's your take on this whole situation? So I guess as a scientist, I never really think about stuff like that because mm. that can't be quantified. You know, how can I test that? Um, but it is, I mean, there's obviously some other factors at play that, you know, there's something guiding these mice differently from one another, despite everything being controlled for. And I mean, re realistically, if you, you know, like from a scientific perspective, what I should be saying is that the changes we're seeing between the same mice is, are probably because of things like, um, you know, like sleep. If maybe the one mouse was at a different stage in its circadian rhythm um, or gender, or uh, they mice have social hierarchies where there's an alpha, beta, you know, maybe they were at different levels in the hierarchy. There's tons of different factors at work. Um, but the fun part as a scientist is trying to figure out how each of these factors contributes to our, you know, neurochemistry, essentially. Interesting. I, that's, that's a good answer. <laughs> I like that. So, uh, so you work on basically uh my brain so how hard is it to clean up i really want to know like after you're done with everything like is it as bad as they say because my some of my like my sisters also work with mice they're in the department of pharmacy they're doing their masters mm -hmm. in something as well so it's like they tell me how hard it is to maintain and use these mice so is it the same or yes it's terrible honestly these mice you said how many shits do i get this episode <laughs> uh, that's you know what already. i think we won't, yeah, well, that's one already. yeah. We, we won't count them we won't count them you, you, i mean doing good. doing behavioral <laughs> studies on on autism you know or do you know doing research on autism we do a lot of behavioral studies on like sociability and stuff so you know if you put a mouse into like an apparatus that's you know pretty big for mm -hmm. 10 minutes and let them run around they can poop as many as like 30 times in that span it's crazy. Like they're just always pooping. Um, and like, actually right now when I carry the mice, you know, when I bring them from like one place to another, I'm not going to just like dangle them. We, we carry them by their tail because it's like the easiest way to do it, but I'm not going to like dangle them by their tail. So I put them like on my arm on my lab coat and just kind of like so that they have a place to stand and they're just constantly peeing all over my arm. It's <laughs> like right now my lab coat smells so bad and I need to wash it so badly. I mean, I guess now we know why you got to carry them by their tails. <laughs> I guess. Nice. It's the hunch, you know? But, uh, ben, yeah, so. Yeah, I wanted yeah, to take ask. Take it away, Ali. Yeah, I wanted to ask. Let's jump. What, how early can you detect autism in the in, brain? Mm -hmm. In a human in the being brain. or in a in the, Oh, I'm talking about a human being, but I don't know. If it's different, let's yeah. get into it. Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, so it's funny because every question has, like, an answer and then it has like a whole like explanation behind the answer that like yeah. i'm trying to like not do too involved <laughs> in the same time. Mm -hmm. um, no it's fine you can dive into it mm -hmm. like, okay yeah, okay so the answer to that question is in humans you know in infants you can diagnose autism very young i mean i don't know exactly the youngest but probably i would say you can do diagnose autism as early as maybe like three months because essentially what you'll start to see is that there's a loss of eye contact you know the the child will stop looking its mother in the eyes it won't respond positively to like social interaction you know you hold a baby in front of you and you you know it goo goo gagas and stuff and it likes interacting with you and it watches your face it 
the baby watches your face and, um, and reacts and mimics and stuff. And you'll start to see that maybe the baby's not so interested in, in interacting with the mother and the father. And then that's essentially about the time where they'll, you know, maybe bring their, um, the, the kid into a clinic and say, can we, you know, have this, our kid screen basically. Mm -hmm. So it can be detected very early. Um, in mice, that's another question. And I'm not really sure how to answer it. I think what my elongated answer that I was going to talk about is that basically scientists avoid saying like a mouse has autism, right? Yeah, because, right? <laughs> yeah that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> because it's a very complex disorder. It's a very human disorder. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is we can mutate the same genes in mice that seem to be associated with autism in humans. And then we can observe social, like a loss of sociability in those mice. So, so, so it's like an induced autism. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything we study is an induced autism, um, whether it's right. for our lab, it's genetics. Some labs study environmental factors, like things like, um, like maternal, like the activate the immune system of the mother before the, they deliver the pups. And um, like that immune activation can often drive autism in the pups. So there's lots of different ways wow. to study it. And how do you induce autism in a mouse? Then so it's exactly out. like what I just said, basically what I, this is my, my streamlined <laughs> answer. If you screen 10,000 children with autism and 10,000 children without autism, and you compare the, their genes, you might find that in 300 of those 10,000 kids with autism, the same genes mutated mm -hmm. and 300 out of 10,000 may not be a lot, but it is substantial and it is meaningful. So what people will do, it's, it's enough for us to look and say, this gene probably has something to do with autism. So people will um, genetically engineer mice without that gene or with some mutation in that gene. And sometimes the mice don't develop, you know, like sometimes it's a fatal thing where basically the, the, the mouse never happens. It doesn't form because it can't like develop properly, but, uh, or sometimes the mouse develops and it's completely normal and the gene doesn't seem to matter. But sometimes it, the mouse develops and everything appears normal. But when you test them in a sociability test, they perform you know, significantly less social than the mice without the mutation. And that's essentially what we do. Interesting. Amazing. So autism can be induced. I know what you're thinking, Ali. Uh, what am like, I, like, can no, be no. induced. No, no, I was, no, no, no. I was, uh, well, I wanted to like actually know like how you do it in mice. Like, do you like, how do you gene code edit? <laughs> A mouse to so have yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah it's pretty complicated mm -hmm. there's a few different ways to do it but essentially um what you would probably do is is i don't know i'm trying to think of like the easiest <laughs> way to this. no it's fine you can go all scientific on it, so yeah we yes. can take it trust mm -hmm. me um <laughs> basically think about it like this if you uh you have uh stem cells right like early stem cells actually i'm not even sure if this is the appropriate way to describe this i'm like really struggling on this basically that i'll simplify it so that i don't sound don't worry i mean i don't blame you he asked you a question that's answered is pretty much a whole course in med school so. <laughs> pretty much that's cool basically that's... i guess because the, the important thing is that most of the time we're looking at models that have um this mutation <laughs> in every cell so what you want to do is basically mutate the gene um, very early, like in like embryonic development, like in the earliest cells, you mutate the gene and then every gene after that replicates, or I'm sorry, every gene, every cell that replicates after that will carry that mutation and you'll end up with a mouse with the mutation in every cell. And then you can breed that mouse with another mouse and continue it. Pretty much because every cell in your body has the same exact genetic code. What makes your hair cell different <laughs> from your skin cell is basically mm -hmm. things. It's what we call turning on and off specific genes. Right. So Precisely. that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what happens basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. It's wow. interesting. Mm -hmm. So did you watch the, the whole, uh, you want to get into this now, Ellie, the whole uh, uh, Neuralink? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, cause, cause I'm, I'm surprised. You, you brought it up. Yeah, sure. Might as well. Right. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> Might yeah, as well. Yeah. Into. Yeah. Pull, pull up a picture <laughs> if you can. Yeah. Pretty much here. Let me, <laughs> let me quickly find this. Ben, uh, I'm sure you've heard of this. Come on, dude. <laughs> I've, I've heard of it. I didn't watch the, the full thing. So you'll mm -hmm. have to give me some of the details, but it, mm -hmm. I can definitely talk about it. Yeah. I, I understand it, what it is, you know? Okay. Yeah. So basically it's a brain go. chip. They want to do, they want everyone to have one. 
<laughs> and uh, they've done their first tests in these picks. And that's and they they want to hire. That the whole point of that demo is that they can hire to do it on a mass scale for everyone to get one, basically. Um, wow. Yeah. So, is Neuralink for you? <laughs> so, what does it do exactly? They just put a chip in your brain for what reason? So it's not actually a chip. It's a, it's a a bundle of electrodes essentially. So. Okay. Oh wow. <laughs> let, let me let me take a step back for uh -huh. a second and just say Please about do. Neuralink. Let me let me just kind of for any listeners. The, there's a few purposes of Neuralink as far as I understand. The first is to implant an electrode into a brain area um, like for people who have like motor coordination disorders mm -hmm. um, or have like, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever. Mo I'll just say motor coordination mm -hmm. disorders. Sure. They can, they can stimulate the motor cortex, the part mm -hmm. of the brain that regulates these movements to like make it movement easier. If you have a spinal like injury or if you have like any like – nerves cut or anything that's that they can rewire it so that um, yes or let's say if you lose an arm and mm -hmm. you get an implant or a, what's the uh, like a there's a word for this i can't think of it um oh i know i know i can't <laughs> think of it too now god uh prosthetic limb prosthetic, prosthetic limb. Thank you. <laughs> that's the word thank prosthetic you yeah limb. like a robot kind of prosthetic that can like move you know mm -hmm. um then they can implant an electrode into the part of the brain that controls the left arm and then by thinking about it it will actually control it you know it can like give you the movement capability to enter it's a it's a brain machine interface is what they call it and that that's a perfect example of that mm -hmm. but the other thing about Neuralink, and i'll just say that is totally feasible and i think that's really cool and i think that that will happen within the next couple of years no doubt like that's already as far as i understand people have already been doing that so the other part about Neuralink, though is that they want to create like a ubiquitous network where everyone has Neuralink and everyone can use Neuralink to like communicate and to like share information you can use it as like a you want to google something you just think and the information pops into your brain um they have very high and pretty currently ridiculous expectations um i have a lot of feelings about it and a lot of thoughts about it one thing i just will say is that like from a neuroscientist perspective there's something extremely unnerving and like it's just off-putting that mm. somebody wants to do this to the brain and like essentially change the way the brain is viewed and the way it works and the way it's used from a human standpoint and then make nope. it on like a everyone has its scale and the fact that he's not a neuroscientist <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, you kind of beat you guys to the race. Let's, let's, let's just put yeah. it like that. I mean, it is what it is, right? Now, here's what worries me. There are a lot of neuroscientists doing it. It's just that he has like a, he has like this, like, we're going to change the world's viewpoint on it. Whereas neuroscientists have a very like reasonable, like, we're going to make movement easier viewpoint, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I do I like okay. it. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where I'm a little bit unsettled about the whole situation. Uh... Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but different electromagnetic wavelengths can have an effect on how we think or how we feel, right? Or is uh, that really well, not what a... do you mean by what do you mean? Like, like if you implant like a microwave into the brain and start like having it emit signals, or do you mean, mean like the other way around? Like, like feelings. This is so gonna crazy. sound crazy, but there's no less of a crazy way to say it. But <laughs> I'm kind of worried they can kind of, in a way, control how we either think or how, what we do, or because I again, would... it's electricity in the most electrical part of our body, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like put two together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These these implantable electrodes both record electrical activity and stimulate electrical activity, and that is wow. part of the um, that is part of the like. Um, I don't know, like the program they're trying to essentially run is like, for, let, me give, let me give you an example. Let me say, or let's, let's pretend that um, I'm listening to a song that I like and I think, oh, I want, you know, Ali would love this song. Let me send this song to him and, and play it for his brain. Like, <laughs> oh my God, I would just, never let's say just that. Start, let's, like, <laughs> let's just start it playing. Um, and essentially what it would do is the el electrode would record the activity in my brain that's being induced by the sound, right? So it would look at like what kind of patterns of activity are happening. It would record that and then it would transmit that information to the electrode in your brain and stimulate your, your brain in the same way. And that, and that allows us to sort of transmit information. 
Um, but there are caveats to that, which I can talk about if you'd like. What are the um, Yeah, no, let's, let's, <laughs> let's get right into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <just laughs> so, yeah, this is, so I made a, I did make a TikTok video explaining this, my thoughts on it. And it's tough when you have 60 seconds and you're trying to explain everything. But the main problem is that, like, we have the same brain areas, the three of us, we all have the same brain areas. And each of those brain areas does this, do the same thing essentially. Um, but it's not like when your brain's developing, there is a guide where we have a hundred billion neurons and every neuron is precisely like pre encoded to, to do a certain thing. What it yep. essentially is, is that we have brain areas that are encoded to do certain things. And as you're developing, you're experiencing things, your genetics all contribute to, the precise like cells that we have and the connections they have with each other. So recording a specific pattern of activity from my auditory cortex when I'm listening to this song is probably going to be different. Like if you take that exact information and mm -hmm. extract it and stimulate it to your auditory cortex, it's going to be different because you don't have the same exact cells and the same synapses and the same structures. So that is the main problem from my perspective that I'm curious mm -hmm. to see how they'll get around that. It's sort of it's sort of like uh, the the pain scale, you know. What might hurt, for example, you might not necessarily hurt me, in a sense, you know, because it's like different. Uh, how do I say it? Uh, it's like different like pain, pain tolerance. Yeah, and then like different thresholds, your different you know, your culture, the way you grew up, and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that affects your So brain. what what it might sound in your head might mm -hmm. not necessarily sound the same in my head. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the different, like the dumber down version <laughs> of saying it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, mm -hmm. if, if, it, if you think of a song, okay, it sounds like this, and you send it over to me, I'm just going to be like, mm -hmm. what is this shit he's hearing? You know, it's not, it's not right. going to be exactly the same. So, so I'm sorry to, if you have more questions, because I'm sure you do, but this is just something that I just got excited about, because what you said just actually made me think of something for the first time. Yeah, let's there get into is... it. Let's brainstorm it. <laughs> so what you said... You, what what i don't know what you say it sounds different in your head from my head right yeah mm -hmm. like yeah pretty much oh and you said and you said the pain threshold thing that like mm -hmm. something like so let's say if you took a needle and you pricked my finger and i said that mm -hmm. felt like a five out of ten pain and then you pricked your finger and it said one out of ten and one out of ten for example your yeah. finger and you said a ten out of ten mm -hmm. right this actually gives us the ability to answer questions that we couldn't in the past because if, for example, why is mine a five, yours a one, yours, yours a 10? Is it because of some sort of change in like my skin or is it actually some sort of change in my brain? So this would give us the opportunity to record the actual activity in our brain in response to that pain and see if there is like an actual difference, like a five, a one and a 10, or mm -hmm. if that's just like a perception difference. So I think it's just a sensitivity thing on the effector, know. you know? It yeah. could be just a sensitivity thing. Like maybe my skin might be like a little bit tougher than Ali's or it might be a little bit weaker than yours, you know? So it could be just that. I don't think it's really like a brain or perception thing. Right. Uh, unless it's a, but there is, there is another thing that they've been discussing and it's been researched. It's like, if I tell you, this is going to hurt, this is going to hurt, this is going to hurt. And then I punch you, you'll be like, oh my God. And you'll cause <laughs> it like, a, but I'm going to be like, don't worry. It doesn't hurt at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and I keep, Mm -hmm. implanting this idea it's not really gonna hurt and i punch you in the same you know same strength and same force and everything you'll be like oh this doesn't hurt at all you know so mm -hmm. that could be another thing you're right no you're absolutely right so this is actually really like interesting to get into so yeah. uh that's the, the from uh, a, like as a neuroscientist the one thing that i'm excited about like the reason i'm excited that elon musk is doing Neuralink is because Elon Musk is an engineer, you know, he, he creates technological advances and having him being, having him work on something that can advance the sensitivity of the like methods we use to read brain activity is going to be super useful. Like regardless, okay. hopefully he will probably develop some more sensitive or more, um, you know, easily implantable electrodes, which will help progress the neuroscience field in general. But there are plenty of people creating these technologies out there. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk yeah. just happens to be super famous. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah the truth yeah, is i mean so, there, there are a lot of brain like developmental disorders that like we wish we could have a cue for like schizophrenia or mental health or anxiety or autism or alzheimer's right <laughs> so like it'd be cool to like be able to like have something in the brain and do that research and capture it and yeah. it'll be good for like people's health you know yeah i think yeah. one misconception though is that elon musk is creating something that's completely brand new which mm -hmm. is completely untrue. There's already something called <laughs> deep brain stimulation mm -hmm. where people are implanting electrodes and activating um, 
you know, certain brain areas, basically. Mm -hmm. there's, well, there's a few different things. I think actually I, I might have just misspoke. I think deep brain stimulation. No, yeah, that is what deep brain stimulation is. There's all transcranial magnetic stimulation, which mm -hmm. is external, which drives blood flow. So there's like definitely people doing this stuff. This is just sure. like mm -hmm. essentially taking the, the big, huge computer mm -hmm. and turning it into an iPhone, you know, like that sort mm -hmm. of process where he's taking some existing technology and like simplifying it, which is useful. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. uh, TM TMS, you talked about transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, Ali, could you pull yeah. up a picture of that? That's like a like a magnetic ring. What's it called? Use TMS. Tran transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, yeah, from what I understand, they can like magnetically change the way your neurons are wired, so that like if you have like depression or something um, through magnetism, they can rewire it, and <laughs> you won't have it yeah. anymore. They the essentially drive blood flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, how does this work? I don't even know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fair. All right, yeah. But, I'm going to yeah. be totally honest. No, I'm, that's fair. No, that's no, 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 that's fair. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of brain stuff, but that was so cool. Uh huh. I think that, honestly, I'm not positive, but I think that the idea is that, like, if you, you see this top picture where it says electromagnetic coil and then magnetic field, like, right in the middle in the top, um, like since we have a lot of iron in our blood, this mm -hmm. this magnet it basically functions as a magnet, and all the iron in our blood pulls the blood to that area and like kind of like concentrates, I see. which increases the activity of that area and like kind of boosts like the health temporarily. That makes it, sense. It, it like you know because blood has glucose in it, blood has oxygen in it, which makes that brain area function better for some period of time. Mm -hmm. But not right. positive about the whole iron thing. Fair, fair. I'll ask you a different one. All right, Ben. <laughs> um, they say that you're using, what, like 85% of your brain at all times? Is that no, it's 20, I think. 20%? 20% percent <laughs> of your brain. Can, uh, can I enter a different realm through more focus and <laughs> training? <laughs> no, I don't think. So uh, I've heard the one where people say you only use 10% of your brain. And that one's not 10%. True. Like, that's, <laughs> that's yeah. you can detect I mean, that. Mm -hmm. It's not true, right? The thing is, like, no, no. I, I, so two things. First off, you definitely use more than 10%. You use 100%. I mean, think about like evolution, evolutionarily, like we are very, and all, all organisms with brains are very carefully designed creatures in that like we've made it through millions of years and are like essentially good enough to survive here on earth. And one of the most important things with that is like evolutionary cost. So if you have like a huge head, right, that's a huge evolutionary cost, especially if it's your brain, which is really sensitive. Um, so we want to like condense all that and make our brain as small as possible, which is why we have wrinkly brains. But also you can't just have a chunk of matter in your head that does nothing. You know, like if you have brain area in there, it's going to serve some specific purpose um, or else it wouldn't exist anymore because like, evolutionarily it would have been selected against or i guess if it was useless or negative i guess it would be selected against but yeah we use 100 percent of our brain for sure right so i'm wondering like so if something like um neuralink comes in right and plugs in and will that be doing the work for our brain will that or would the brain still stimulate the same way i guess there are applications where it could um kind of like take some of the pressure off your brain. That's kind of an interesting thought, mm -hmm. but that's, that's almost sort of a, um, like an ethical question. Yeah. I think. It well, is. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> well, Cause what gives these companies the right to interfere with how your brain is normally supposed to function in specific environments. Right. So it's completely unethical now when we look at it like this, or we can look at it at a different, see, this is, this is what I hate. <laughs> like all of science is ethics because it's like very yes but it's a yes but uh, kind of conversation like you can look at it like the way i said or you can see it as it's really good because it can de-stress and help you get through hard tasks by like elevating the burdens of you know whatever so it's with ethics it's very hard to decide mm -hmm. whether it's right or wrong yeah for so science, it's just science. Sometimes I just like see that science is like, yep, we got to go. <laughs> we got to make some new things and we got to keep exploring and researching and stuff. And I guess like it's I pretty mean, cool because like you're solving all these disorders and you're helping people have like healthier, better lives. Right. But then at the same time, it's like you're, you're interfering. 
But I guess that's medicine you are. for you and science. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of against it. I'm not going to lie. Like, I view it in the point of uh, why. Why interfere? You know, if someone's going through stress, I see it as, you know, that's good. Let him go through stress. He'll learn from it or it'll change him in a way and it'll develop this person. But if from day one, we've been given everything easily, you know, and we never felt stress and sad and whatever. Like, it's just, you know. It removes I, the natural balance. What do you think? Yeah. I think there are definitely like purposeful implications that are not even bringing ethics into the into the question. Mm-hmm. For example, like if you're if you're addicted to cocaine and you really want to get off cocaine because it's threatening your health, quitting any drug is extremely difficult process. So what if you could implant an electrode in your brain that every time you you want cocaine, it would stimulate your brain as if you had cocaine but you don't actually get cocaine, right? So then you're... Whoa. you're training, <laughs> yeah, that you're just sounds like brain. taking cocaine with like a few less steps. Well, you know? you're taking... Well, you're activating... You're, you know, just imagine you're pretending... You're, you're telling your brain, hey, look, the same thing's happening that happens when you have cocaine, but you're not risking mm-hmm. your heart. You're not doing, you know, bad things to your nose, whatever. So, um, I mean, yeah, like, I guess. I think that's, you know, I think that's a... Or like cigarettes, let's just say. You're quitting cigarettes. Um, any any drug like that or you want, or heroin you know you want to quit and this kind of expedites the process and makes it a lot easier but people are already doing this stuff with deep brain stimulation but um but the the ethical component is like what if you're a 13 year old kid and you go mom for my birthday this year i want Neuralink because i want to be able to go on twitter with my friends in my head during class are you going to let a 13 year old kid get an invasive brain surgery for something like that you know like I think that's where the ethics really comes into play is when you're not treating some sort of disorder. You're just doing it for fun. And that's what Elon Musk's vision is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is what, for fun? For fun. Yeah. I think, everyone gets I think one. Okay. He wants to make Let everyone me... smarter by like making the internet available remotely by just like snapping your fingers and thinking about it. And then you get information, um, which is cool, but. If the brain is a muscle though. I mean, it's sort of like me taking steroids every day, just a pure buff, you know? Like yes. it's, it's, it's not really, it's better to train and practice with your brain, you know, learning new things every day, actually putting the effort, yeah. you know, cause mm-hmm. then everyone would be smart and it would be hard to distinguish the people who are actually, you know, high up there in IQ and in hard work and, and people who are just, you know, just internet and mm-hmm. oh, well, that's, that's the quantum theory of relativity or whatever, you know, yeah. like well, it's, it's, you said everyone would be smart. But there's also another question here is that you're, it's not like you just get this. You're a brain surgery away from having it. Brain surgeries and the um, materials, you know, the electrodes that are implanting are not cheap. So you probably will only have access to Neuralink if you're wealthy enough to get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exaggerate (laughs) intelligence for wealthy Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. and create an even larger gap you know, in socioeconomic status. Yes. But yes, right? Because yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that's something I never thought mm-hmm. about, to yeah. be honest. Wow. Like, uh-huh. Yeah. Ben, yeah, let's talk sure. about um, I, I, IQ. Do you know much about like how it appears in the brain? I like when it develops. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I know. Just IQ in general? Yeah, just like, because it is like a huge factor. I've been reading up like on like people's success and health and happiness, right? It's, there's like a, like strong correlation right yeah Between iq and stuff so i'm wondering um if you can enhance it <laughs> if there's how to detect it if you know where it is what it is i don't know yeah i mean i actually haven't done too much research or you know reading at least i've done no research uh, actual <laughs> research on like what brain activity patterns or connections or anything like that are associated with higher iqs i'm sure the research is out there i'm sure mm-hmm. of it um but I don't actually know. What I would imagine is that people with higher IQs probably have like higher connectivity between like key brain areas. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean- That makes whole, sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this whole field of like, like circuitry in the brain is just like exploding. People are really starting to really dig into what circuits control, what functions, all sorts of things. What happens if you turn off a circuit? You know, what happens if you- I guess no one's actually done this, but I just thought of a cool idea. What happens if you create a circuit between two brain areas that don't normally interact? Whoa. I mean, then, <laughs> then you might uh, actually wait. Isn't that the same as like you know, putting someone through complete uh, like? Uh, how do you say it? You know, when you uh, 
make someone m- forget everything and then you start amnesia. implanting memories in their brain wow. amnesia mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah isn't that kind of the same concept of what happens if you try and make a you know a connection on your own because that's dangerous you guys you can honestly like if you can do that you can make someone believe that they're a terrorist and you know they've been doing it their whole lives and they basically <laughs> put that connection in their heads and mm-hmm. or something to that effect you know mm-hmm. So yeah. it's like that's the plot of the Bourne Ultimatum, <laughs> the Bourne movies. <laughs> yeah. Wait, seriously? <laughs> yeah, that's basically the plot. Like this guy, Matt Damon, he forgets all his memory, and then they implant that he's like this like regular dude, but he has like a history, and people start chasing him and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so it really all comes down to the question of how much do you want people to interfere with your brain at the end of the day, mm-hmm. right? Like some people are like completely against, some people are all, all for it. And then you have the anti-vaxxing Karens on one side. They're <laughs> obviously not going for this. <laughs> and it's like, it's hard, you know, it's hard to talk about such a topic without looking at it from every single aspect of mm-hmm. what it is, mm-hmm. basically. So uh, was- are you for or are you against it? I, I, uh, Neuralink in general? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm for any application of neuroscience that will improve the lives of people with debilitating conditions. Mm-hmm. So if Neuralink ends up being one of those things that I'm for it, if it ends up being something where Elon Musk personally comes into every labor delivery room and implants a chip into your baby's skull just because they're alive and now they can connect to the network. Hell no. You know, I don't think, I, I don't know. I think that if he wants to create this big network of everyone, on you know Neuralink, um, it's not going to happen. I think, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I think that the short-term implications of helping motor conditions, things like that, paraple- uh, paraplegics, things like that, I think will be useful. And I'm for that. Interesting. Yes. What about you, Ali? Are you with or for it? Uh, I'm. I'm still thinking about it because I mean, it's it is a whole. It's a whole thing. <laughs> it's like, do you want iPhones? Like iPhones? Yeah, sure. They're helpful. They help us out in a lot of ways, right? They help us get places. They help us contact each other and stuff. But at the same time, yeah. I don't know if it's making us like less human. I don't know how to walk around my neighborhood without my <laughs> without my Google Maps. So maybe that's making True. me yeah, less yeah. smart. Well, the way I see the differences with this little bad boy right here, it's mm-hmm. more of a, you know, yes, you're under the whole electronic handcuffs of the whatever you want to call it. <laughs> society or whatever, you the know. Society. But like with Neuralink, I feel like, you know, a secret society. But with like Neuralink, it, it's more to your face, like we're putting that shit in your brain, you know, and you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, kind of, I'm worried. Ali, I think you're worried. I'm going to sound it, crazy, uh, but I really am. So you're going to, it's not, well, as like Ben said, the first people that are going to get it are people who need it. Like people who are blind or people who are paraplegic or like, and once they have it, <laughs> right. And you see like the change, like with them and they are an, an ad- advantage, right. <laughs> Cause they have this thing in them. So everyone's going to have to get one. Because if you don't get one, you're going to be at a disadvantage as, you know, and that's where things get scary. Mm-hmm. They can choose to turn you off or on <laughs> and all that stuff. I mean, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's sort of like uh, you watch that Jack Chan movie called The uh, Tuxedo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've watched it. But... I feel like I saw it a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. It's where Jack Chan like finds his tuxedo he wears and all of a sudden he knows Kung Fu. Mm-hmm. Yes. And also yes. Superhuman. So, Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like he knows how to dance tango or whatever. So I'm kind of worried it turns into that, but it's completely out of our control. <laughs> as a human being. Well, here's another thing that's that's a little scary about it is that currently, if I walk up to someone, you know, in a park or you know, public area, and I mm-hmm. want to manipulate their brain activity, there's no way I can do that. But if they have an implantable electrode, and I find some way to externally uh, adjust the operation of that electrode, right? Like with some sort of magnet or something I can, and obviously I can't have like remote control over a person, but I could probably walk up with like some sort of powerful magnet and like cause their electrode to short circuit, which could cause them to have like a surge or a seizure and die or something mm-hmm. like that. It creates a susceptibility, which is mm-hmm. very dangerous and can be hacking. hacked. Exactly. <laughs> hacking. Yeah. There's yeah, another thing. <laughs> Hack. Because, because this whole sleep project of, you know, like you have you have you guys heard of the Russian uh, sleeper agent project? What's that? <laughs> you haven't heard of, it's basically they send these uh, Russians to the United States. This is I think back in the Cold War, 
um, the, they completely make them forget that they're Russians. They forget everything about Russia. You know, they, they, they're convinced that they're Americans living the normal American dream and everything. But all of a sudden with like, I forgot what it was. If it was like a secret set code of word. sentences that they <laughs> say, or like a code word, it activates this, this unknown memory inside their brain. Right. It's like a sequence. Cause in the brain, it's like a sequence mm-hmm. of, you know, from one neuro like mm-hmm. cell yeah. to another. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. causes like a specific set chain reaction of memories and they would wake up into who they were. So from, you know, Johnny, he'd become Yugoslav and he's ready to take down the USA from the inside. But it, it's happened. Is true? It's, wait, it's wait, not, wait, like, wait, 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 slow down here. <laughs> Is that true, Ben? Go ahead. That, <laughs> can you do that with someone? I mean, it's like top secret shit, so I'm not sure. That's almost like, like uh, that's almost like Zoolander, isn't it? Like <laughs> where he like hears uh, the one song and he starts going crazy, becomes like a murderer. Yeah, like that hypnotism is what they use there, right? In that movie. Yeah, right. I think so. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, as far as like implanting thoughts and, and ideas, I, I don't think there's any way to like hide memories and then allow them to be retrievable through certain methods. I wouldn't say it's high. Di- I'd say it's more of a, it's like almost hypnosis. You, you remember it. I make you forget about it mm-hmm. until I want you it's to remember like it. In your again. deep like, you know? psychology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. I don't know. I mean, Nick, <laughs> I guess it. So let me just take a second to explain my understanding of memory. Okay, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh-huh. So in the brain, you have all these cells, these neurons, and they communicate with each other at synapses. You've probably seen like a picture of something like this, yep. where it's like, you know, two, syna- or two cells. Synaptic synapsing. cleft, all that stuff. Yep. yep. So the <laughs> idea behind memory or the current, like at least probably one or maybe the prominent theory of memory is that um, certain like sets of synapses between certain cells encode a memory so when you think about like like i'm going to think about this moment right here right now in an hour and when i think about that it'll probably activate the same neurons and the same synapses that are active right now and as you the same sequence you mean yeah i mean it's it's sort of a sequence yeah it probably is a sequence you know there's like probably a temporal dynamic to it and also like a spatial dynamic and it's just like think of it as like you know you have this big network of connections and like maybe there's a billion connections in a certain area and like out of that you have like one here one here one here where you end up having like 300 firing at a time and those 300 firing at the same time or in a certain sequence is what a memory is so like i forget even why i was <laughs> saying this in the first place but yeah. i guess explaining you, memory and the theory of memories <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super agent too. <laughs> so i guess if you could yeah, i guess if you could stimulate those that pattern you know then you could um elucidate a memory that wasn't previously accessible but they also like there's retrieval um i forget the process of retrieval but basically you know the more you like every time you think of a memory then you have to like re um like save it essentially like because every time you think of it it activates those synapses and then those synapses stay alive right and they stay there because like you're using them whereas if you don't think about a memory for like years and years and years the synapses might die and then you can't remember it so um retrieval requires activating those those synapses and then sort of like re saying like is this going to be saved um so if you can implant a memory and then like as long as they don't think about it but then when they retrieve it it's there through some sort of thing like a song or whatever then as long as the synapses are still um intact then i guess that it will be possible possible there we go we have it <laughs> there we go Friends. sleep agents are a thing yeah, which okay. is by the way, it's the new, it's the new uh, Call of Duty uh, <laughs> Sleeper expansion. Agent. By the way, yeah, it's called Call of Duty uh, Black Ops Cold War, which really does go in depth of the Russian sleeper agents in the United States. I don't know if you guys watched the trailer or not, but it's really cool. I'm definitely <laughs> buying it. You know, plug it, Call of Duty. <laughs> check it out, sponsor us, <laughs> sponsor us too. <laughs> sure, if you want to. Ben, you know? but yeah, it's to, just really. I want to circle back to to autism a little bit um just because like i really want to know because like there's so much to it right so um you said it's a spectrum right are so are we technically yeah. like all on the spectrum um or is a lot it of just... people say that mm-hmm. um i would say no i mm-hmm. mean i think certain things right like like uh ocd for example like we're all on the spectrum of ocd mm-hmm. even though it's not a spectrum technically um but i think that 
like I'm not autistic. I don't know anybody. Well, I do know a few people that are autistic, but I guess I feel that by saying everyone is somewhere on the spectrum is almost insulting to people who do have autism, because I think that a lot of the people who have autism are very proud of it and very, um, you know, they kind of embody it and which I think is awesome. And I guess I think the other thing about like the whole, are we all on the spectrum thing is like I said earlier, there's a social component of it, which I do think everyone lands somewhere on a social spectrum for sure. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the repetitive behaviors and the fact that those two things go together means that there's probably some sort of specific, um, you know, like neurological system that is participates in the control of both of those things Mm -hmm. that is somehow disrupted in autism. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would think that typically everyone system, whatever system that is, is not disrupted. So, okay, cool, cool. Fair. So you said two parts, social and then uh, the repetitive Repetitive behaviors. Okay. Why does, what is the, why is the social, like why are people with these brain activities socially reserved or they're incapable? Our yeah, so, struggles. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's one of the biggest mm-hmm. remaining questions in autism research, essentially, mm-hmm. is like, wh- why? I mean, first off, what brain functions are important for sociability? And then why do those, which, which of those brain functions goes awry in autism and why? Um, there are a bunch of different brain areas that have been implicated in autism. The brain area that I study is the prefrontal cortex, which you may have heard of. It's kind of like right here. And it's super important for like anything that makes you human kind of in a way, like any higher level thinking, sociability, these kind of advanced functions. Um, But it's also exists in other, you know, in like mice and rats. It just may have different, you know, may not have as strongly evolved functions, but in the prefrontal cortex, there is sort of a theory, and I guess this extends to other brain areas too, of excitation inhibition imbalance. So like I said, you have all these cells, they interact with each other, they have all these synapses with one another, and those synapses can be either excitatory or inhibitory in that they're either activating or shutting off the next cell in line. So like, let's say the three of us are, uh, are synapsing, right? We're three different cells and I have a connection with both of you and you both have a connection with each other and me. Let's say I'm an inhibitory neuron. So I only shut off you two, but let's say Ali, uh, Los Angeles, Ali, (laughs) and let's say both of you guys are excitatory neurons and that you Mm -hmm. both activate the other cells. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Now let's say Ali Shamari, right? That's me. (laughs) <laughs> you are the cell that we're talking about in this case and if i'm excited if i'm inhibiting you if i'm shutting you off and ali is turning you on then um which i'm sure he does all the time <laughs> then, <laughs> then uh you're gonna be about even right like your your net activity inhibition is gonna be about even yeah. but let's say ali were to kind of like shut off and like not be active or not really do anything and i'm just inhibiting you then your activity is gonna go from this like homeostatic level to too low or vice versa if just at least stimulating you then you're going to be too high and so this this general idea is that like due to some change or something causing it there's a loss of excitatory transmission or inhibitory transmission which leads to a general hypo or hyperactivity of the whole brain area and either direction can affect the function in a negative way so and that's kind of what i study so that's the one i'm most comfortable talking about and you can detect these things right like oh yeah for sure the parts of the brain that are so it's just not, it's not the neurons themselves aren't like sparking up in these areas, right? When you're saying- Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. what we do literally, mm-hmm. like what I do is something called electrophysiology, where we actually take these brains and we, ha- we you know, remove the brain. We have the brain and, and we basically, this is going to sound really like gross and probably some people are like, oh my God, but we slice the brain. <laughs> and we preserve the slices. Sandwich. So they're, yeah, <laughs> we preserve the no, slices. See, now you now you made it disgusting. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm like sorry. what he said was normal, but <laughs> yeah, it was fine. Sorry. Yeah. You, go ahead. Uh, um, I just had to remove the brain sandwich out of my head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have these slices, and the and the cells are still alive. And then what we basically do is take this tiny little electrode and stick it onto the cell and record that cell's activity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we can like stimulate all sorts of things. Like we can stimulate the inhibitory um, 
connections or excitatory connections and sort of record what the end result is for that cell. And in doing this, we can turn, we can sort of create how intact are the inhibitory and excitatory um, mm -hmm. inputs. And we can sort of measure like that, that balance. And is this the same thing for like the repetitive behaviors? It's like just the, like the same idea kind of, or is that a different explanation? So mm -hmm. the repetitive behaviors are interesting because they, they probably don't have as much to do with the prefrontal cortex as sociability does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sociability definitely is involved in, in PFC or PFC is definitely involved in sociability. I should say that's been shown over and over again. The repetitive behaviors are probably more so involving um, a structure called the striatum, which is involved in like movement initiation and like uh, goal oriented behavior. So there's, I guess sort of a big question. Can you, can you pull it up, Ali? Sorry, I want to see what is the striatum. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. The Spell it, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love how uh, Ali's sort of like the DJ. Like, yeah, you can play that down. <laughs> <Let's, laughs> that. It's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much what I do on this show. <laughs> I just search stuff. I'm guessing this is it. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> you have it's, it's, it's kind of like this big ball. Mm hmm. Which picture should I go for? The first, starting from like the left. Um, the one with can Wikipedia. Like a, can look up, look up striatum coronal. Oh, actually, there's already one right there. The, one? the fourth one in from mm -hmm. the left. Yep, right mm -hmm. there. I don't know if that's going to take you to a YouTube video or not. There you go. Nice. Uh, no, no. Well, do you want me to open the YouTube video? I mean, we can. No, I mean, I don't know what this video is going to be about, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yo, you never know on? what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, the, the striatum is made up of these, you know, the caudate, the putamen, nucleus accumbens, um, and then the internal capsule, which typically I don't hear too much about. But um, again, what we're looking at here is a human brain sliced from the front. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, these, these brain areas, like as a whole, caudate, putamen, nucleus accumbens, they all regulate... Um, movement so actually in like parkinson's um these structures are kind of responsible and involved but yeah the 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 question and i don't know too much on like the molecular end of like what's going on in the striatum in autism but um the idea is that these are probably involved you know if they this is probably a central brain area for that that phenotype so and the other thing is that in my personal study that i did um i was able to correct the that EI excitatory and inhibitory balance. It was off in the prefrontal cortex of these mice that have a gene mutation that's associated with autism. And I was able to correct that and it actually significantly improved the um, sociability and cognitive performance of these mice, but it didn't affect their repetitive behaviors. So, and this was only in prefrontal cortex wow. exclusively there. So that for me is enough evidence to know that um, the PFC may not be totally essential for, for these Behavior. repetitive behaviors. Wow. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Ben, we don't have too much time here. <laughs> yeah, I out. think, yeah. We, I want to ask we you have one more thing. Our... I want to ask ahead. one more thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, so like, um, is there any sign of how to reverse these issues in the brain with autism currently? Great question. So right now there are no therapeutic you know, pharmaceuticals for the social symptoms of autism. Um, I believe that probably in the next, hopefully in the next 10 years, we will have something that works, you know, that helps. Hmm. Um, like a pharmaceutical, a, like a drug you can take that can help relieve. Yeah. Like, a, mm -hmm. like how people take SSRIs for depression mm -hmm. or, um, you know, antipsychotics for schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. We want to have something for autism. And um, th this is actually more of a controversial topic than I had known that um, some people are, you know, they hear this and they think, no, no, I'm, I, I have autism and I'm perfectly fine. I don't want treatment. You know, the fact that you want to treat me is messed up and insulting. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess but then that comes also then again to ethics, whether <laughs> yeah. they are in the mental capacity to take such a big decision or not. They're mm -hmm. clearly saying no, but do they know that they're saying no? And that is mm -hmm. right. still mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, autism is a spectrum. And the people who say that are probably on the, you know, on a, on a part of the spectrum where they're very high functioning and doesn't actually, you know, hurt them too much. 
but there are a lot of people with autism who are like severely impaired in, in that they like their social relationships are severely impaired you know like they have a hard time communicating even though they want to and these are the type of people who we would want to um you know provide some sort of opportunity to you know improve this for them so interesting well Amazing. we've had our time little folks this was this was this was great i'm very happy to be back and i'm glad that i came back on ben ryan's show because this is very very interesting this is this is fun thank you ben for coming thank you, ben. is there anything you want to shout out anything you want to let the world um, know yeah i mean can i shout out my organization is that all right you can, you can shout out anything let us you know like, buddy mm -hmm. All right, sweet. So, well, by the way, thank you very much for bringing me on. This has been a really You're cool. More than discussion. welcome. And you actually yeah. gave me a couple of research ideas that I might. Uh, yeah. <laughs> tag tag my name on. I need some stuff on my CV. Yeah. Before I <laughs> um, Thanks, buddy. Yeah. So the, the shout out I'll, I'll go ahead with is um, I created an organization called the Aspiring Scientists Coalition, and it's essentially a place where mm -hmm. people can, um, you know, students who are interested in science can go and join for free. It's totally free and, and you get access to a bunch of events that we hold. So it's like networking sessions, Q and A sessions. We have scientists come in and present their work, present their path through science. And it's basically like, there are so many questions in science um, that you need to ask. And we're providing like all answers in like a free online structure. So, and that's why it's called a a ASC ask. So if you want to check it out, it's ASC science, ask science.com dot com and that will be a link in the description below if you would like to check it out mm -hmm. uh so if you've reached this part of the episode like subscribe do all that like, good stuff subscribe yeah. come on <laughs> i yes. yo i haven't done this in a week but this is usually how we sign out it's a salute to cover the camp and peace